five minutes later. Be nice to your sister. And here, with his bird's eye view and a brain to match, is Mr. Know-it-all. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on where and when you're watching this broadcast. I'm Thomas Festa, my friends, and this is Disclosure Tonight. Happy Monday, everybody. It's that day of the week, down to the hour, minute, and second that we come together as a community to go ahead and talk about those things that the government doesn't want to talk about. To talk about those things from science fiction, and yes, talk about those things well, you know, from the X-Files, which things are we talking about, friends? We're talking about the things that you can go out and see your house in the, over in the evenings, but you just need to go outside and look up. We're talking about good old-fashioned UFOs here in Disclosure tonight, and we still call them that for a good reason. Why? Because there's a word for it in every single language around the world through a perpetuity. Who in the heck knew? So as our federal government continues their 75-year war against the extraterrestrial presence, how do we know, friends? Oh, just take a look. It's all a military operation, whether it's the Navy chasing them through the air and under the sea, or the Air Force chasing them through the air to figure out where they crashed, or bringing the CIA to recover the bodies and to test their DNA against ours, and to use their technology for our weapons of mass destruction. That's why we come into Disclosure tonight here many nights a week to bring you the latest news and information, and tonight is like no other. We've got a great interview, hopefully you'll stop back soon, with Jack Safardi, who's been in the back. He's had a little technical problems, but we'll get back to that soon. He is a retired, no, he is a CIA physicist who's got some amazing information, some information that the White House doesn't want you to know, that those bozos who work for the DOD don't want you to know. That's why we come together many nights for Disclosure tonight with myself, Thomas Fess, our friends in the back, for yet another episode of... Okay, disclosure tonight you're back jack don't worry about it we've got you buddy <laughs> we'll get you started in one second all see, right I'm, i got a screen oh uh, i see myself I we mean, got you get off i think but can they hear me they go well they can yeah. hear you but we'll get you started in a second we got some things to cover okay, here my friend we got you fine jack we can hear you loud and clear we can hear you fine jack yes they can't hear you. Our audience can't hear you yet. <laughs> we'll get you a deal. be fine. Okay. People use the laptop all the time to come on me. So. Yeah, okay. All right. So let's go. Up the shaved in your phone? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm pretty sure. Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll yeah, go. Good. Good. This way, if you call me or I call you, you'll know it. Yeah, it's yeah. I'll, uh... I'll have time tomorrow for us to have a conversation. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I have time because my... Hey, hey guys, my, we're live. My, uh... We are live. My lady partner is in L.A. with her. Okay, we are live, guys. All right, so, well, the conversation in the back continues and we start getting there. What, we're going to start off with some... Br oh, my gosh. We're going to start off with some breaking news while we get our guests in the back taken care of. We, You know, we've got uh, Chuck Schumer who came out today said some amazing things in Congress. Holy cow. Let's go ahead about this. We haven't heard anything about what's been going on with the UAP Disclosure Act. Chuck Schumer's been silent up until this point. Let's go ahead and play a clip on Chuck Schumer talking about the UAP Disclosure Act before we get started on this interview with Jack. Let me jump into this and get to the desktop. T oh, oh, wrong one. Desktop video. Here we go. Let's go ahead and play Chuck Schumer talking today in the House uh, in the Senate about his bill that he was put out there with Senator Rounds, known as the Senator as the Schumer Rounds uh beam. We'll get there, my friend. All right, here let's go ahead and put this. All right, here we go. Let's Yeah, all right, let's go ahead and get this going here and play this video. And here we go, friends. Finally on UAEs. While it's not related to China, House Republicans are also attempting to kill another common-sense bipartisan measure passed by the Senate, which, which I was proud to co-sponsor with Senator Rounds as the lead sponsor, to increase transparency 
around what the government does and does not know about unidentified aerial phenomena. Unidentified aerial phenomena generate intense curiosity for many Americans, and the risk for confusion and misinformation is high if the government isn't willing to be transparent. The measure I championed with Senator Rounds would create a board, just like we did with the JFK assassination records, to work through the declassification of many government records on UAPs. This model has been a terrific success for decades. It should be used again with UAPs, but once again, House Republicans are ready to kill this bipartisan provision. Now we're going to get the NDAA done this year, just like we have for more than six decades. But there's still some more work to do. All right, we got that one little clip, and I've got one more clip coming in. as a lead story coming into us from News Nation. Let's go ahead and play this clip, and then we'll get on to our interview with Jack to see what Jack thinks about this. Here we go. No mainstream media is covering. Just within the last couple of hours, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has been pleading from the Senate floor that lawmakers do not kill his amendment requiring the U.S. government to tell you what they really know about UFOs. You have to wonder, why is there such a fight for, fa for lawmakers uh, to kill this bill? And it's all developing right now. What do they not want you to know? Uh, right now, we're really at the precipice. We'll know soon whether or not this bill survives or dies and whether the American people will get to learn the truth about all of this. Joining us now live from the Capitol, uh, who's been joining, following all of this, is News Nation's uh, Joe Khalil. Joe, tell us the latest. Yeah, Brian, so in some ways this is not that surprising, given News Nation has actually been covering this since last week, that the Schumer amendment to the big defense bill, which, by the way, if passed, would be an unprecedented level of disclosure about these UAP or UFO files that the government has been classifying for years, uh, that it was in trouble. We knew that, and we knew that the sort of push behind its opposition was a group of House Republicans, specifically those within the Intelligence uh, Committee. That's what our sources had been saying. Uh, but what is surprising is that Leader Schumer brought this to the floor today and chose to make it one of the big subjects that he talked about addressing the entire country and the Senate. And I want to, before we go any further, give everyone at home a chance to hear exactly what Senator Schumer had to say. Unidentified aerial phenomena generate intense curiosity for many Americans. And the risk for confusion and misinformation is high if the government isn't willing to be transparent. The measure I championed with Senator Rounds would create a board just like we did with the JFK assassination records, to work through the declassification of many government records on UAPs. This model has been a terrific success for decades. It should be used again with UAPs, but once again, House Republicans are ready to kill this bipartisan provision. Now we're going to get the NDAA done this year, just like we have for more than six decades. But there's still some more work to do. So, Brian, there are every day hundreds of fights that go on behind the scenes here on Capitol Hill. The fact that Leader Schumer has now brought this to the forefront uh, indicates that this is no longer going to be something that is being handled behind closed doors, but rather we're going to see maybe a more public posture and people who are working on this issue come forward more in the spotlight to sort of hash out mm. their differences here. Yes, yeah, certainly very telling that he was talking about it today from the Senate floor came as somewhat uh, of a surprise, like you mentioned, with everything going on in the world, that he brought that up today. It shows how intense the fight is getting. Yeah. What I can't figure out, Joe, is why is there this group of lawmakers fighting this so hard? I mean, it just makes you wonder if there really is something that they know about that they don't want the American people to see. So it's a really good question. It's one that we've tried to get answers to. Last week, we spoke with the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Turner. Um, he basically only gave us one response to one question and then uh, sort of walked away. And that was the end of it. We've been trying to email and text uh, because essentially what the amendment does, I mean, it's 64 pages or so. So it actually accomplishes a lot. But it, in a nutshell, uh, it uses language we've never seen before. It actually says in the text of the bill that it would require disclosure for all records dealing with, quote, non-human intelligence, which is something that, you know, if you just on its surface, it sort of blows you away that that language is in this kind of text. So if that, uh, theoretically, is just bogus and 
there's absolutely nothing there and it's, it's crazy and conspiracy and all of that, uh, you would assume that passing that bill wouldn't really have any harmful effects. It would accomplish nothing, right? So it does beg the question as to why there is such strong opposition to it and why so many people who may be leading that opposition won't answer the question of why they're opposed to it. We heard uh, Chairman Turner tell us that he felt like the language was poorly written uh, and he didn't think it was going to pass ultimately, but didn't elaborate as to what in the language was poorly written or, or specifics that he mm. had issues with. So that continues to be a question. And again, I go back to the fact that Schumer is now talking about this publicly. Maybe some of those disagreements will happen out in the open and we can have a, a more transparent discussion about uh, why people are opposing it, why they're not. Yeah, let's hope so, so we can at least find out why some of these lawmakers continue to oppose this bill. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for the update from the Capitol. We know uh, you'll stay on it there if anything develops. We've got a special... Absolutely, and as we uh, jump back to our segment of where we're at, let me get back in here. And what I want to do is I want to get ready uh, to say get ready to dive into the mind building mind-bending realms of physics and beyond. We're thrilled to introduce our esteemed guest, Dr. Jack Sarfati, uh, a renowned physicist known for his groundbreaking work in quantum physics and consciousness. Dr. Sarfati is here to take us on a journey through the mysteries of the universe with a, with a career spanning decades and a knack for making complex theories accessible. He is not just a brilliant scientist, but a true visionary. Buckle up as we explore the edges of science and uncover the secrets of reality with the one and only Jack Sephardi. Welcome, Jack. How you doing, my friend? You're muted. You need to unmute yourself. A little mute microphone. You need to press the little mic on the button. We got you now, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, I did. I, you know, we, we hear about everything coming with the UAP Disclosure Act, and we look we look at this of where it could potentially go. You know, I, I like to, he, to hear your point on this, to potentially look at and understand what kind of, you know, if this, the, what would be the impact in the scientific community, especially on UAP research? How do you think the UAP Disclosure Act would impact the field of UAP research? particularly in terms of public and scientific perception. Yeah, well, okay, that's, uh, that's the issue that Gary, uh, Gary Nolan set up this whole foundation to deal with that problem. You know, Gary's trying to do, since he's, you know, he has the prestige of being a full professor at Stanford University, and, you know, he's a very successful uh, Entrepreneur, you know, made a company, kind of like he was, you know, basically that kind of thinker. And oh, shit, shit. Can you hear me? We got you now. Sorry about that, Jack. I'm not sure the chat can hear you. We just had to fix you. Sorry about that, Jack. Start again. I'm sorry about that. I had, oh, I had, I had muted the back before when we we're dealing with the start of the show again. Um, can you restart the Okay, so uh, you want to repeat the question? Yeah, so how do you think the UAP Disclosure Act will impact the field of UAP research, particularly in terms of public and scientific perception? Okay, well, I, I have, you know, I'm sort of in conflict about that. Let me explain something. My professors at Cornell, Ivy League School, 1950s, 60s, they're the guys who built the atomic bomb. Right. Uh, you know, if you saw the movie Oppenheimer, Hans Bethe, who's a key guy, Hans Bethe was my tutor, was my professor at Cornell and guys like that. OK. And so because of that, I think basically because of that, essentially the CIA drafted me into this whole thing, uh, you know, like over 50 years ago. So none of this stuff is new to me. All right. Now, the reason I think that the Republicans are, you know, don't want to reveal this is because of the weapons implication and also because they don't understand the physics behind it. And whatever people in the government, in the Defense Department, I guess, you know, when they don't understand something, that's why they're, you know, they're, they're afraid. And, and, and they're also afraid that... Uh, that the Russians say will uh, get there before uh, before us. 
And of course, that fear is very good. That fear is actually justified because I was actually invited to Moscow last summer to lecture on this. I didn't go, but my, but they wanted me to go to Moscow in July uh, to uh, uh, Moscow State University Physics Department and you know give a talk about about the physics of the, uh, of the phenomena. So, and the thing is this, that um, uh, the problem's really solved. I mean, in terms of the physics explaining the propulsion, explaining the, you know, all the telepathy, all the paranormal stuff, yeah. uh, is, uh, we understand it now. The, 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 the basic physics explanation is, it's kind of very elementary physics. Okay, and now it's not elementary to you know to you people who don't know you know uh, the mathematics stuff like that, but to you know my level of uh, theoretical physicist, it's almost obvious what we're seeing. Now, how to the understanding uh, phenomenon doesn't mean we know how to reverse engineer it right away. You know, there's a difference between the basic conceptual understanding, like for example, in 1940 or so, all the physicists in the world understood uh, the, the, uh, the nature of nuclear fission. Nuclear fission was discovered in Berlin in like 1936 by this Jewish woman physicist Lisa Meitner. And as soon as she did that, right away, bang, even Adolf Hitler knew you can make an atomic bomb. Okay? So the, the, the basic idea of nuclear fission, of the bomb, is, is very simple for a physicist and even, a, you know, ordinary people to understand. But to translate that understanding into technology, that required the Manhattan Project. And uh, Hitler tried to have uh, uh, Werner Heisenberg do it, and uh, the Nazis failed, thank God. Now, there's some reason to think that Heisenberg deliberately sabotaged it. And by the way, I, I knew I, I knew Heisenberg personally after the war. I was at his institute in Munich in 1966. Um, so so there we go. So that's um, now now as far as Chuck Schumer and all these guys, I don't know why they're arguing with each other unless they're afraid that um, uh, that you know the weapons potential, uh, the, the the weapons potential. Well, the weapons applications of the stuff I'm working on is more uh, dangerous in a way than the nuclear bomb. And why do I say that? Because you cannot use a nuclear weapon unless you want to kill everybody, right? There's no way, there's no such thing really as a tactical nuke. You know, suppose Vladimir Putin were to explode a small tactical nuke uh, in, in Ukraine. Fortunately, he doesn't have to do that because uh, Ukraine has lost the war. Yeah, Putin won, and that was really never in question. So, but if he were to do that, or actually, if we were to do it, because because Russia's winning, if Zelensky somehow got his hand on a tactical nuke, and you know that would clearly escalate, and we're all dead. There's no way. There's no way to contain the use of nuclear weapons. So uh, you can't really, especially in the unstable world we're in, we cannot use a nuclear weapon on the battlefield. But what I'm talking about, the gravity weapons, we can use that. And not only can we use it, it's being used. These weapons are being used, but they're not being used by us. They're being used by them, by non-human intelligence. Okay. Uh, you all know about Robert Hastings, right? Yeah, you all know about right? and, and you know the disabling of the nuclear weapons and Rendlesham and all these all that stuff. That's all real, and uh, I mean I don't know because I don't I don't have that kind of class of classified information. For for all we know, the ETs may have neutralized all our nuclear weapons. Hopefully they have, and hopefully they've neutralized the Russians and the and the North Koreans. Who knows? But probably not. But they they that that technology is there. And uh, but it's but we don't have it, right? All right. So uh, well, let me let me just interrupt for a ahead. second, Jack. We yes. had uh, Captain Robert Salas on the show the other day. Yeah. Yeah. He was in charge of the uh, ten nuclear uh, missiles that were turned right. off by right. the uh, NHI civilization yes. back in 1967. And yes. what uh, what Salas told us is that those uh, Minutemen nuclear ICBM missiles have a logic coupler, which is the guidance yes. system. And yes. it was bench tested by the manufacturer of Boeing, and they found that it was at negative 10 volts, which means that by remote, this NHI technology was able to sort out the missile's uh, guidance, which then made the missile deactivated, because it yeah. won't fly. 
if it doesn't have an active uh, guidance yeah, so, system on it. Uh, yeah. So that's how they did it. Yeah, okay. Continue. Uh, repeat. Re yeah, repeat that. But what was the logic coupler? What what did the beam do to the logic coupler? It melted it, or what? What did it do? It shorted the, uh, the circuit, what? the transistors. It shorted um, out the transistors on out. the uh, yeah, yeah, logic out. coupler. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So like it was like an EMP or something like that. It, uh, but it like, was yeah, targeted it's only to that EMP, guidance yeah. system. Yeah. Okay. So that it, it's a. Um, uh, yeah, well, that is, uh, I'm not sure if they would, yeah, it's probably not an electromagnetic beam, it's probably a, a gravity beam that's able to, yeah, it's probably a gravity beam, the kind of stuff that Matt Visser in New Zealand is publishing papers on. See, all the, all the, the, the basic ideas of these beam weapons, uh, Matt Visser, he's a top gun guy, very smart guy in this whole field, theoretical physicist, uh, and what he's done, he's published uh, papers, uh, he calls them uh, pressor beams, stressor beams, and I forget what's and tractor, tractor beam. You know the thing with with the UFO pulls the the, the car up. Yeah. So yeah. all that stuff, the mathematics of that in terms of Einstein's general relativity is pretty elementary, and uh, it's all been done. It's all published in Physical Review. Yeah. You know? But what they don't know how to do, see, because normally the coupling of electromagnetic fields to generate gravity is so weak that you would need a tremendous amount of energy to do this, to do all these weapons. And that's that's the problem that I solved. See, I know how to do it with small amounts of energy. That's what nobody else knows how to do. I can, well, the NHI know how to do that. But uh, so that's the problem. And, um, and but to add, so I, I know how to do it in principle, but how to actually engineer it using the metamaterials and design, that's gonna involve Using you know the Chat GBT, the artificial intelligence yes. to try to design the right metamaterials, which will have the right electromagnetic right. resonances. You know, to do all this, thing. and that's 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 beyond just but me. Before, that, before I get to Wes Decker on this, Jack, there was a news story I read today with regards to research coming out. I'm not yeah. sure if it's coming out from DARPA or somewhere where they're talking about the ability of consciousness to be able to affect metamaterials on a different way than we're able to understand, which is basically using consciousness to affect uh, like the okay, inside well, of a craft. Okay, well, to see. I have to see this. I can't tell from what you're talking about. But I... Okay, let, let me explain. It, it's 1975. You, you know the book, uh, you read the book about me and my friends, How the Hippies Save Physics, David Kaiser, MIT, bestseller, okay? It has some of what I'm talking about. This guy named George Koopman, he was like an army agent, he was funding us, and he said in 1975, he says, uh, Jack, there are two things the CIA wants to know that we want you to work on, okay? How does consciousness work, okay? And how do flying sources fly, all right? Now, now what you're saying is possible, but I have to see in detail whether that particular yeah. claim, okay, there is a paper, and I, I've, I've posted it many times on my Twitter. Anybody wants to get more detail, if you, if you just join Twitter and follow me on Twitter and just look at the Twitter feed, every day now I'm posting like my, my research journal, my notes is all for the whole world to see. Okay, so you can see you could you could follow up through your homework, but there's a guy named Pavo Pilkin. He's a top professor of cognitive science in Helsinki and Sweden. And a year, just about a year ago, he published a paper on the quantum theory of consciousness. And it's a, it's a nice review paper, uh, you know, for, for other psychologists and you know, I guess scientists, but you don't have to be a, a mathematical genius to understand this paper. You know, it's a popular paper, semi-popular paper. And in section seven, he does a beautiful job explaining the Jack Sarfati solution of what's called the hard problem of exactly how consciousness emerges in matter, you know, the mathematics, the, the quantum theory of it, and, uh, and what the consciousness actually is in such a way, in such a way that we can make machines, you know, nanoscale, what are called quantum dot artificial neural nets, sort of like what's in your iPhone, like, like, the, like the neural net that's in the iPhone, 
but at a you know, actually right now the the new what is the ME the M3 chip the Apple M3 chip is operating at three nanometers and that's that's good enough that's good we could just adapt we could just adapt the neural nets in in, in in the M3 chip and other chips like that nanoscale stuff and we just have to pump them resonantly with the right electromagnetic frequencies and lo and behold they're going to go conscious because that's what we are see this guy Stuart Hameroff you may have heard of Penrose Hameroff Penrose got the Nobel Prize <clears throat> uh, Dave uh, Hameroff has this idea as the explanation for how our human consciousness emerges in what's called the microtubules I won't, won't go into detail you read you read Hameroff you read Penrose's books on there's a lot of stuff on the internet about it so all, so uh, what, what we are if you if you look with an electron microscope at at the human body at inside the nerve cells what is called the microtubule structure it's a, it's a computer it's just a, it's just a molecular quantum computer that's what we're, we're machines we have yeah, molecular machines okay so we could just make artificial microtubules, and uh, we, we could do it easily now because the M3, the, you know, the Apple chips at, at uh, two or three nanometers, I think that's good enough. Yeah, because the microtubules are about eight nanometers and about three of them. Yeah, we're right at the edge there of being able, being able to make artificial intelligences that are as conscious as we are. Of course, we have to provide them with suitable complexity and suitable inputs and outputs, you know, sensors and motor stuff. But I'm talking about, uh, you're gonna get into your t Tesla car. <laughs> it's gonna talk back to you. It's gonna, not only will it have uh, artificial intelligence, but it'll have consciousness. It's gonna have the same kind of consciousness as we have, or as your dog, you know, dogs, animals, cats, they, they, they're conscious emotionally. They, 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 ju they just can't talk, right? But they have the same, I mean, they have the same DNA structure. It's simple. Once you have the DNA and, and the quantum mechanics and, and what's called the, uh, the uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, we, we have all the physics, all the pieces of the puzzle in place. You just stick it together and bang, you have a conscious machine like us. Yeah, we're coming, not that special. Yeah, coming okay. from someone who has experienced both Teslas and Apple, Wes Decker, you have your hand up, my friend. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> First, I just want to say, uh, Jack, it's such a pleasure and an honor to have you here with us on the show. Um, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. Um, I had a question for you, actually going yeah. back to what you were talking about when we were, um, Mike was describing how those nukes had been deactivated. Yeah. One of the um, things that uh, Captain Salas said is that it was really hard for them to wrap their heads around what had happened because the circuitry was EMP hardened and the yeah. cabling was super shielded. But what you were describing, it sounded like was something that was more gravity based. So would that yeah, mean that the gravity, kind of hardening wouldn't work? Yeah, it's a gravity beam. It's a gravity beam. And the gravity doesn't give a damn about electromagnetism. It, you know, it's space. What gravity waves are, it's it's the contraction and expansion, uh, what are called stretch squeezing of space itself. So nothing can so so it's nothing can stop it. Electromagnetic fields have no impact on. It. But what happens once they focus that beam? I guess they can focus. I don't know all the technology. I don't know. You know I don't know everything. You know, but I have. I, I see how it will work. Uh, uh, once that beam gets to its target, it then transduces the gravity field, goes into an electromagnetic field. So once it's inside, then it generates a, an electromagnetic field, and that fries it. You know, so, yeah, they, so that's an ultimately a perfect way to bypass all of the defenses yeah. that we built in. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there's no defense against against gravity beam weapons properly used. I, right. I, I mean, I mean, actually, there is. What the only way to defend yourself against gravity beam weapons is with another gravity beam weapon. Right. Which wow. which, which kind of ties back into what you were talking about, Jack? Because your theories yeah. out there suggest that UAPs operate by creating local distortions in time, space, space, time, yeah, which all suggestion. ties back to wait, gravity. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait, let me get something clear. I don't want to sound too much like the Pope, you know, it's <laughs> pontifical. It's not a suggestion. It's the, it, it's an absolute certainty in the sense that we have a theory of gravity and electromagnetism due to Einstein 
and Maxwell, and then the quantum, you know, all the quantum guys, Feynman and, you know, Bohr and all these guys, Sommerfeld, Schrodinger. Okay, the basic problem is very elementary. It's not hard. And there is an obvious way from known physics to explain all this stuff. It's simple, it's direct. You know, in science, you look for the simplest, as Einstein said, make it as simple as possible without making it simpler than is possible. Well, it turns out the problem of the propulsion, well, let's call it warp drive, like Star Trek warp drive, okay? That problem is very easy to understand conceptually in terms of what Einstein did in 1915, basically. What he did over 100 years ago. And why these guys didn't see, although I actually I do know why they didn't see, but it might be too complicated to say. Why everybody's been blind to that is kind of funny. It's actually a funny story, but I don't think I have enough time to explain. I understand why all my colleagues didn't see what they were missing. It was hidden in plain sight. You know, that Edgar Allan Poe thing, hidden in plain sight. Um, and I'll tell you, actually, the only reason, no, I, I, I should, uh, let me be a little bit modest. I didn't see it at first either. It took me, I didn't see it until about 2011, 13 years ago. Okay? I didn't really see what everybody else was not seeing, but was right in front of us. Okay? And why did I see it? Nobody else saw it? Because I knew the UFO stuff was real. Yeah, you know, from the CIA, from my contacts. I knew I knew the stuff was real. I kept thinking, so how can you do this? And then it's something, oh, well, there it is. It's just this coefficient Einstein's equation. You have to just make it bigger. And if you do that, that's it. Explain everything falls into place. Okay. And I gave that talk at a uh, you know defense advanced research agency uh, meeting with NASA uh, in Orlando, Florida in October uh, 28th, I think of 2011, uh, I was invited, my boy was paid, General Pete Warden, who was a, he was a general uh, head of the Space Command, I guess at Cheyenne Mountain at one point, uh, and he left there and he became the uh, administrator at NASA Ames, and a former kind of informal student of mine, Creon Levitt, was his assistant. In any case, you know, we all knew each other, and, um, and we helped set up this thing called the 100-year Starship in 2010 in San Francisco. As a result of that, it led to this meeting, this DARPA NASA project in Orlando. And uh, the, the general paid my way, NASA paid my way, you know, my airfare, my hotel, um, you know, to give this talk. But when I gave the talk, I was immediately met with a lot of resistance. Guess from who? Eric Davis. Eric Davis, and actually a guy named, uh, I forget the other guy's name, um, the guy from the Transcendental, uh, well, it doesn't matter, okay. Uh, and and um, now Eric, of course, knows all about the UFOs too. Like Eric has classified information. But my paper was on the use of metamaterials, this is 20, 20, 2011 now, the use of, resonance, of electromagnetic resonances in metamaterials to amplify the coupling of applied electromagnetic fields to generate strong gravity warp fields, and this explains the flying saucers. As soon as the flying saucers, Eric Davis said a couple of, no, 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 don't talk about that. So maybe because it's, you know, it's, but it's interesting because now he's, you know, now of course he, they're all talking about metamaterials. I was the first guy to, connect metamaterials with flying saucers, right? But I got a lot of flack from, from, from the very people who are now pushing my, you know, my basic ideas. It's pretty, pretty, pretty uh, interesting there. All right, I'll stop here for another question. Yeah, absolutely. Faze will go ahead, then we'll go on to West. Go ahead, Will. Yeah. Um, yeah, hi, Jack, how are you doing? Hi. So... Number one, UAP works. You're saying that UAP works with the uh, low power warp drive vehicles. That's what that's what I understand. Okay, and wait, it's, now, so slow. it's hard for me to hear what you just said. Okay, say can you hear me now? Slow. Can you hear me now? Yeah, but uh, but speak okay. slow. Okay, can, can you say you said that the UAP UAP works right 
by low power warp drive vehicles. Yes. Right? So I, I understand that. Now, does uh, geodesic play a part of how the UAP works? Yes, work? yes, it's a geodesic, yeah. The point is, yeah, good question, good. Okay, let me say, what a ge okay. In relativity theory, in classical relativity theory, we talk, you know, just we idealize it. You think of little particles moving on paths, right? But the paths are uh, four-dimensional. They're in the four-dimensional space-time paths. It's not the same as three dimensions. I mean, you can project down, you know, but they talk about world lines. Now, now there are two different kinds of world lines. Well, actually, there are three. But uh, what, the geodesic world lines are very special. In geodesic world lines, basically gravity to a good approximation is canceled out. So for example, let me give you an example of a geodesic. A geodesic is the International Space Station is going around the Earth, right? It's going around the Earth in free fall. It's, it's in this, like an elliptical circular orbit, okay? But the guys, they're all weightless inside. See, if you're inside, if you're on a geodesic path, in space-time, you're weightless. There's no gravity in, in, your, in, in the Newtonian sense. You're weightless. But it's a closed path, okay? However, from the point of view of a, of a telescope or a radar system on the surface of the Earth, it looks like there's an acceleration. It looks like it's accelerating, right? So there are two kinds of acceleration. There's what's called the apparent acceleration, or they call it kinematic acceleration, which is measured at a distance. We, in other words, how do we know? How do we know? Why do we think that space vehicle is accelerating? Because we're using a telescope, we're using a Doppler radar, we, you know, we're using instruments that are measuring light waves coming from the object to us. Okay, so to us, it looks like there, it looks like there's a G force on them. Actually, the G-force is on us because we're the ones who are actually accelerating. But so that's another hard thing to wrap your head around. When you're standing still on Earth, you're actually accelerating, really accelerating, what's called proper acceleration, radially outward, but you're not moving because the space-time is curved. See, in flat space, that couldn't happen. But in, gravity, in curved space-time, your, your weight, the fact that we're, we have weight is that the G-force is on us. We think the G-force is on, is on the space station, but it's not. They're weightless, okay? So that's exactly now, if you can understand that much, you can understand all this stuff where, they, they, where Commander Fravor or these other guys, Ryan Graves, Ryan Graves, whoever, they say, and the, the damn thing is going like 20,000 miles an hour, and then it does a U-turn, and the G-forces are 5,000 G. You look at Kevin Knuth's papers, or even Happy Love with that, with you know, the stupid thing. They say, oh, it's all this G-forces. They don't even understand general relativity. So the point is this. The obvious explanation to any theoretical physicist of any kind of Cecil, you know, I'm, you know, you know, any competent theoretical physicist, at least when I was trained, you know, by Hans Bethe and the guys who built the goddamn bomb, okay, any theoretical physicist right away would understand, ah, what has to be happening is that the ship itself is controlling its own geodesic path. And how is it doing that? Well, Einstein's field equations tell us how it does that. There's a certain coupling parameter. There's a coupling parameter. And, and if you could change that coupling parameter, you could do whatever the hell you want. And that's what we see them doing. So right away, the mystery is gone. Okay? To anyone who understands basic uh, relativity theory, general relativity theory, it's a very simple problem. It's the kind of problem that, I don't know how it is today, but say back in my day, if, you, if you're a graduate student, uh, say at Caltech, MIT, University of California, I was at UCSD uh, and UCR, you're at your qualifying exam for your PhD, right? And the professor says, the professor, if, if the professor gave you, you know, Elizondo's five observables, have you, you're all familiar with that. The professor would say, Okay, here are the five, here's, here's the data. How do you explain it? Any, a, any really good graduate student, given enough hints like that, would come up with my solution, because it's not hard. It's kind of obvious. 
you know, to you know, if you, you know, if you have the brain, the, the talent yeah. for, for physics. Yeah. So, so, uh, so the only reason, the only reason that I saw this solution back 12 years ago, and say Kip Thorne, and all these top guys didn't see it, is because number one, the stigma, they, you know, they're not going to think about if they think about UFOs. They're gonna not get get funded, right? So because and that's the intelligence agencies doing their number, right? Which was stupid. But yeah, you know, yeah, well somebody said uh, intelligence agencies kind of an oxymoron, and that, that seems to be true. <laughs> Talking uh, about intelligence being an oxymoron, you brought up the point about uh, Avi Loeb, but Avi Loeb and Sean Kirkpatrick brought out a paper where they said that if you have a UFO that's traveling from sixty thousand feet down to fifty yeah. feet in a fraction of a second. Yeah. It has to be an optical illusion because these things should be bursting in fireballs versus... That's because them. they're stupid. That's because they don't understand what I just explained to you. Yeah. Okay? That's because they're stupid about... Well, they're not... You know, they're, they're what I would call intelligent fools. No. They know ordinary... Okay. A Newtonian, an ordinary... The NASA and NASA type thing with rockets, rocket technology. Yeah, what he's saying is true. But it's a totally different... In other words... There are two different, okay, here's the, in physics today, there are two different paradigms for motion. I'm trying to say this in a popular way. Oh, yeah. What Avi Loeb and Shane Kirkpatrick are talking about, they're talking, they have a picture like a rocket or a jet plane, ordinary thing, that's moving a, a piece of material that's moving through space relative to the air molecules. That's what they're talking about. And that's Newtonian physics. That's everything Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and, and you know, and, and, and the missile forces and all that. That's that kind of, that's basically Newtonian motion. Okay? And even special relativity motion is also that. The only difference between uh, Newtonian motion and special relativity motion is uh, the speed. That when you, when you have speed up close to the speed of light, then it becomes, you know, you have other effects, special relativity effects. But general relativity, gravity, see, uh, uh, special relativity doesn't have any gravity in it. But as soon as you put general relativity and you have curvature of space and time, okay, then you have what's called warp drive in which I call it motion without motion. Because, you know, if you look at the Alcubierre thing, uh, in the simplest model, if you have a that tic-tac, that cylinder, uh, and the tic tac is coming toward you. Okay, if the tic tac is coming toward you, the space in front of the tic tac is contracting, like pulling the thing, and the space behind the tic tac is expanding, like pushing it in a sense. But it's the space itself which is, so to speak, in a way, moving relative to the space outside the warp field. Okay, and um, and again. I, if I had time, I could explain it very beautifully in terms of what uh, Roger Penrose makes these beautiful, what we'll called light cone pictures. You can understand it. Uh, um, do you have, okay, can you, do you have that, can you put up that PDF? Yeah, I can. Uh, before I get that up, Wes Decker, okay. you have your hand up really quick and I'll get this PDF up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Jack. Um, you were mentioning uh, Hameroff and Penrose's um, yeah. OHRR theory a minute ago, and I had a question for you. One of the things that they have talked about um, is the possibility that these microtubules are um, can be stimulated with like terahertz, um, like yeah, yeah. terahertz radiation. My question yeah. is that I've also heard in regards to some of these materials that have been recovered, that the speculation is that these metamaterials may actually be designed to um, amplify or do something also with terahertz for radiation. That's right. That's correct. So that's correct. I'm just that's curious correct. what your what your thoughts were about well, if those two actually, you know, well, uh, might... I, 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 it's not just my thoughts. It's what I know to be a fact now because I've been given classified information. The, okay, the ships are alive. Oh, wow. The ships are conscious. The material, the ship itself is conscious. But because, you know, and I have the physics, because the sec, it, it's two sides of the same. It turns out generation of consciousness and generation of warp field are like two sides of the same coin. Uh, 
There's this uh, guy I used to work with back at Cornell many years ago called Lenny Susskind. He's a big now professor at Stanford, the World Hologram Universe. He calls ER equals EPR. ER being like wormholes, Einstein, Rosen, like little stargates, and EPR being the quantum entanglement, okay? So you can think EPR, the quantum entanglement is like the mind, and the ER is like matter. It's the mind-matter duality and how they interact with each other. And... Um, and it's kind of like we're, we're actually kind of living in a, in a matrix. See, if you could control, if you could control gravity with small amounts of energy, that also means you can control with your mind, the with the electrical fields in the brain. Okay, and there's actually the ETs do the NHI does that. I can't get hence the conversations about the craft having no controls what? or anything because we're dealing with stuff that's controlled by consciousness. Yeah. Okay. But you got, yes. But and but kind. Okay. Yes. Okay. Here, here's the thing. Now, where is is? See, if Richard Doty was here, this would be a good time for him to pipe in. He's, he's not here yet, right? No, not yet. Okay. Richard Doty has a slide. If you've seen, have you seen any of his uh, talks? He talks about Cardinal Three. You know about Cardinal? If there's anybody? Do you know what Cardinal Three is? What Rick Doty talks about? I don't think he's talked about that here, has he, Mike? No, he really hasn't. Okay, wait, okay. So, wait, I'll Jack, show you. I'll you show it to you. It? Get, my, okay. get my PDF. Get my, I got your PDF. You got what PDF? page do you want me to go to, my friend? Uh, well, well scale, go, keep going. I'll, uh, keep going. Go slow. Go slow. Oh, no, okay, let me get you back here. Here we go, dude. Did it military go, mind slow, control? Slow, slow. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Go slower. Go slow. Go, go slow. Go slow. Keep going. We'll come back to these. Keep, keep, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. I thought I, thought I have it here. Keep going. Come here, stop. Oh, you just passed it. Go back. You just passed it. That was Rick Doty's. There we go. There. There it is. Can you have? Can you? Can people see a big version of it? Yeah, they can, can now. You? Okay, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. This is Rick Doty. There. That, so the that captured machine, craft was designated Cardinal Three which is described as a 30-foot-in-diameter, saucer-shaped, yeah. flying craft. Uh, the exterior was made of an unknown material, but it was extremely lightweight that could absorb yeah. sound waves. Cardinal 3 weighed 304, uh, 3,405 pounds, and on the exterior of the craft contained three seating positions, which had control panels. There were no other right. conventional controls, wires, switches, knobs, or buttons. The yes. flight control system was unknown. Propulsion system was to uh, was too advanced to understand by the scientific yeah. personnel. Uh, That's right. Until Cardinal Jack Three was considered to be along. an extraterrestrial flying craft. Yes, it is an extraterrestrial flying. And not not only is it a flying, it is a time machine. Jack, would you mind machine. explaining? Would you mind explaining just a little bit more when you say that uh, consciousness and the warp? Uh, drive are just two different sides of the same coin. Could you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, well, it's hard to do that without uh, having a blackboard and having my notes and showing. It's hard to do it because it's really mathematics. Okay, you I got gotcha. you. Yeah, okay, but but uh, and uh, if you look at my Twitter feed, I do post a lot of stuff on the Twitter feed. Okay. Oh yeah, I love your Twitter feed. <laughs> I'm okay, a, <laughs> I'm a big okay. fan. Okay, now, but 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 the point is that the. How can I say this very quick? It, it, it's what Lenny Seskind calls ER equals EPR, basically. Um, and uh, but here's the thing. Okay, let's just get back to the operational stuff here. The point is, all these machines, uh, any warp drive craft, is automatically a, a, a conscious artificial intelligence. Because for one thing, you need the con you need you need supercomputing to to uh, to manipulate the warp field. You know, it's 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 a very complicated uh, computational problem. An ordinary classical computer could not navigate, could not operate it. Okay, and and uh, even the quantum field. I mean, you you need very powerful. Uh, I call it a post quantum computer to control the damn thing. Now. Um, Yes, those, okay, the, what can I say about this? Now, you know if you've, if, you know about Philip Corso? Yeah. Philip Corso Phil, wrote Dr. The book, uh, the, uh, Colonel Corso retired, yeah. uh, who had a bunch of, if you want to call it, uh, parts of the craft within his possession that he dealt with. Yeah. He was also the one who brought up uh, the, uh, Project Serpo, which has some strong weight behind it. 
Okay. Now, here's the thing. I don't know about the Project Serpo stuff, but if you look at his book, he has exactly the same thing that Richard Doty's talking about. Exactly the same. Okay. Now, one could say that, oh, that's no big deal because Richard Doty just read the day after Roswell and put Phil Corso's material into his talk. Maybe that's true. However, and I now I have to be very careful what I say. However, there is a third military source that I work with, in a way, okay, who had never known about Doty or Corso, who, as I says, actually was in charge of such a craft, several years, every day going to work, okay, who described the craft to me. He's no, you know, he's no longer has access to the craft, and I can't go into details why. But and when I said to him, oh, that's exactly what Phil Corso said. And he said, who? And then, you know, and then there were some other people there who told him, showed him Phil Corso's, and he went absolutely bananas. Yeah. So the point is, yeah, you know, it's like we're detectives, like doing police homicide work, right? So there's, you know, pieces of evidence. So, so here is totally independent corroboration down to the last detail of everything that Doty. Plus, there's more he told me, which I cannot tell you about. There's a lot more that's even more extraordinary. Okay, but the craft is real. I have, you know, a firsthand guy who was in charge of the investigation telling me it's real, who I know, you know, could not, is not lying to me, has no motive to lie to me. In fact, is putting his life at risk, but he could go to jail by telling me this, you know, because, you know, he's broken his classification thing. And I'm not saying he's in the United States. Okay. Yeah, there was a, okay. So, so there we have it. Okay. Was there a question from Neil? Neil, did you have your hand raised? Is that Neil? Oh, we've got actually we got Neil, but we got Cosmo next. Cosmo. Okay, go ahead. Hey, Jack. Um, yeah. So, you were mentioning that the craft is conscious earlier. Yeah. Um, so, based on the craft being conscious, uh, are the occupants inside the craft also conscious and aware of yeah. giving yeah, the yeah. machine well, directions? Are they giving the machine directions, or are they uh, fusing goes their both ways. Okay. with them? Uh, well, uh, a, a human can actually fly the. You know, they actually have human pilots flying the machines. Uh, you know, be, uh, if the machine wants, it's up to the machine. The machine is like. a... Think of the machine as a living, it's like a robot, you know, it's a, it's a living, it's a, uh, what John Lee, solid state, it's a conscious solid state entity. It's artificial, it was made by some, probably somebody else, you know, but it is, it, it has a will of its own, it's conscious, it's a personality. <laughs> it's like a human, in a way. If the machine likes you, literally, it will communicate with you telepathically, well, you have to sit in the seat, you have to, you know, you have to sit in the seat, that you know, with the, with the hand panel, all that stuff. You sit in the seat, you have to get in a certain position, and then you are put, it's like your screen, the screen in your mind is connected to the, you know, so like this. So and, you're able to tether into it somehow? Yes, yes, it plugs it, you plug that, your mind, you, you merge, you, oh, you do, okay, you want to do Star Trek? And it's a mind build, yes. Your mind and the machine's mind, you get entangled. It's quantum entanglement, but with signaling. It's telepathy, whatever you want, okay? And that's how, and, and suppose you want to go to an exoplanet. Suppose you want to go to Mars. Yeah, Ellen, Elon, you see, if Elon Musk wasn't so stupid, right? he's smart, of course, he's genius, but I mean, if Elon Musk, who said just that he doesn't see any evidence for it, I don't know what kind of bubble he's in. <laughs> but if Elon Musk was here listening to me to all this, Look, nobody, and also Jeff Bezos, those schmucks, they're, way, they're putting millions of dollars into this engineer, rocket engineer. I mean, it's brilliant engineering, you know, where the thing comes down and all that. It's great. But it's stupid because you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. 
Elon Musk could get into his Tesla car, right, with suitably with uh, oxygen and all that stuff, you know, suitably insulated, and he can, uh, you know, it's like it's like uh, um, back from the future, right, into his car, and he can, with with anti grav, with warp drive, and he can get to Mars in you know in maybe ten minutes, you know, with warp drive. And that's how they get here. That's that's what that's what's happening. Yeah. I mean, this, this is we're seeing it right in front of us. It's happening, but people are so you know they, they're so. So it's not like they're just going from point A to point B and just kind of getting there over a long period of time. They're going insanely fast speeds to get from point A to point B. No, like, it's not speed. No, okay, no. The other, see now you, you, you don't know how to think about. You can't even ask the question, Robert. Uh, if you uh, let's go back to, I could sh- kind of show you how, but we have to go to my slides. Let me get this. All right, which page this. you want me to go to now? Yeah, go to yeah, go to the side. If you want to see how that? Uh, uh, keep going. Keep go scanning down. Keep going down. Slow. No, go, go slow. Go keep. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Let me see. Keep going. That's the few. Oh yeah, that's a whole other thing. Keep going. Let's see where I think it's at the. Uh, oh wait, stop. Stop there for a minute. Stop there. Now go up one more. No, yeah, yeah, right there. That, 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 that. You're, you're, I have the, the graph. I want the graph. I got you that the graph. graph. Let me go ahead yeah, and just right get there. the scroll that's a little it, bit. Zoom up yeah, a bit more. It. There we go. Okay. This is the work of Matt Visser. You see the flying saucer there? See the flying saucer? On, yeah. Uh, you see them. And then you see the flattened cow. That's the missile. Okay. So that's, that's called a pressor beam. That's a pressor beam. Okay, and that's probably what they use. They may have well, and there's also the stressor. The stressor beam, the stressor beam will like stretch and squeeze the metal. The point is this: you can distort the metal or the the logic coupler, whatever, the, whatever. You can distort that piece of equipment. You can, you, you know, you, you could. Okay, do you see your the way Uri Geller? You know about Uri Geller the way he bends metal? Okay, it's yeah. sort of like that. Yeah. They tr- you could twist the metal, and just the thing becomes unfunctional. Yeah, if form and function, okay. If you if you distort the form enough, you destroy the function. So that's what the, that's what this this is what this is what that mathematics that these papers show how that's possible. What they don't show is how to make it strong enough to work. See, that's a separate problem. That's the problem I solved. Interesting. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Interesting. Okay. Interesting right. concept. Right. Hey All Nick, right. would you mind muting, please? Okay. Okay. Now go down. Let me. Let me. Let's get back. Keep. Keep going. More slides. Go slow. Keep going. Keep. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. By the way, this is on Vimeo. You can see it on your own speed. Vimeo. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Hold on. I gotta mute Nick here. Who's go that? ahead. Uh... Keep going. Keep going. Gotcha. <laughs> Okay, keep going. Ah, ah, stop right there. Stop, stop there. Stop there. Right here. Yeah, so that the light con. This is you have to understand this stuff. The best way to understand this stuff, uh, there is a short article online in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. I think it's called Causal Structure and Light Cones, and it explains sort of what I'm trying to explain to you. It's like it begins. It's, it, 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 okay, this is this is the fundamental structure of relativity theory. It's called the light cone. Every point in space time has such a thing. The the past light cone. Those are light rays coming into your detector. The future light cone is uh, light rays leaving the detector. So, okay, the past light cone is like what uh, the receiver. Say, a receiver, and the Future light cones like a transmitter, okay? And everything in, according to special relativity, this is a four dimensional diagram. All matter, all ordinary matter moving slower than the speed of light, the world lines are inside the cones. You cannot break out of the cone. To break out of the cone, that's called like a tachyon. It's called, it's, it's, that's fast and light motion. And we're not going to allow that for now. We're not going to allow that. So this is ordinary motion. What 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 um, what Avi Loeb and Kirkpatrick are talking about in this stupid paper is they're assuming is a fixed light cone like this that the light cone or is rigid the orientation of the light cone is rigid and all the motions of of the particles are inside inside the past light cone or the future light cone 
Okay, that's what they're assuming. And that's the mistake. See, that, that's the mistake they make. Because go on to the next slide. Keep, keep, go on to the next slide. Okay, okay, stop, stop there. This is a picture. This is the picture that Avi Loeb and Kirkpatrick, this is their premise, which is wrong. This is why they're wrong. But they, they don't even understand why they're wrong because they, they don't know. You know. I don't know what Avi Loeb, yeah, he should understand this, but he doesn't. Okay, what Avi Loeb and Kirkpatrick, see, Avi Loeb is what he's an instrument man. He's good at making instruments. Instrument men are not usually good at doing theory. It's hard to be able to do both. The last guy who was able to do both was like Enrico Fermi, you know, back in the 1930s. He could both do experimental physics and he was a top theoretical physicist. But they're almost, you know, they split. They're almost like two different cultures in a way. And it's hard for them to communicate with each other at times. It's part of the problem. All right. But th this, is the, this is the special relativity picture. And this is what's, this is what is in the background of everything Kirkpatrick and Avi Loeb said in their paper. And if this were the correct picture, everything they said would be right. But it's not the correct picture. So now let's go to the next slide. Go to the next one. Gotcha. Here we okay. go. Yeah, go to the next one. Okay, okay. Oh, okay, stop, stop it. This is just, oh, well, okay. This is just the red, the red light cone, the red triangle is called the future light cone, the blue triangle is called the past light cone. So if if uh, what I can't see the name of, um, of what I have, we here. have Alice Alice on the top, Bob on the bottom. Okay, I'm so 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 if 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 Alice wants to see Bob, Alice wants to see what Bob is doing, right? So what she has to do, she has to receive a light ray going on the red light cone, a right ray coming from Bob and ending up at Alice's detector, you know, at at the vertex at Alice's vertex there. That's her detector. So, so, so that's how Alice sees Bob. Alice sees Bob only because she, a, 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 a light ray moving in vacuum. Now, if it moves in matter, you're in trouble. This is all like in space or even in the atmosphere where, you know, you, you don't have to worry too much about, you know, if the atmosphere is not too dense, you could approximate it like a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So in order for Alice to, to know what Bob is doing, okay, she she has to catch a ray of light in Bob's future light cone into her past light cone for a detector. Okay, that's called a that's like a basic transaction. All right, and this particular if you see here the two light cones are they're like spin think of spins in a ferromagnet they're they're aligned like a ferro they're aligned parallel to each other. That's because there's no gravity there, there's no curvature. See, with curvy, with a flat space time, it's all, all the light cones are like the spins in a ferromagnet in a domain of ferromagnet. Right. They're all lined up. Of course, the spins are three, you know, that's an analogy. So they're okay. basically go, go, they're yeah, exi go basically existing and going beyond the effects of gravity, where gravity what? will, will uh, cause... No, I'm not going beyond the effects. I am, I have, there's no gravity here yet. I'm going gotcha. beyond, yeah. I'm going beyond, I'm going beyond no gravity. I'm going, Bingo. now I'm going to, to gravity. I'm not going beyond gravity. I haven't gotten to gravity yet. Right. You jumped the gun. <laughs> All right, go to the next slide. There we go. Okay. Oh well, that's a thing. That's just I was saying. That can, that's uh, you know that's what people normally think of of uh, fast light. They think it's outside the light cone, but that's a wrong picture. That we don't need. That's the wrong picture. But keep going. Go to the next one. Ah. Okay. Now stop. You're gonna have to. You know, do your homework and, and study this on your own. This is difficult stuff. You're not all going to be able to understand it just from listening to me, but you'll at least get some idea of what you don't know. This is a picture of how black holes form. And here you see, this is curvature now. The curvature, it's the tilting of the light cones. Okay? Right. But everybody, in, if you're inside the light cone, you don't feel anything. You're like at a geodesic. You're weightless. But the light cone itself... The light cones near the surface of the black hole are tilted at a different angle, so to speak, relative to the light cones far away where there's no gravity. So this is the so gravity is the tilting of the light cones. And by the way, this is Roger Penrose. You know, Roger Penrose is a genius, you know. He got the Nobel Prize, you know, with Hawking. This is Roger Penrose's picture. And once you use Roger Penrose's picture, all this stuff becomes almost trivial. It's almost Mickey Mouse, even a you know, a 10-year, a 12, a smart 12-year-old kid. Can, can, you know, can understand all this stuff. They can say, okay, all right, so go to the next slide. 
Ah, now here we go. This is this is the warp drive now. This is the extreme case. What's happened now? Is that Alan? Okay. Here, the two light cones are at orthog they're at right angles to each other. Okay. Now is this Al? Yeah. So Alice. Look, Bob thinks Alice is going faster than light, like, you know, infinite speed. But Alice is, is, is inside this light cone. And Alice is just, she's on a geodesic. She's not even moving. But, 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 but now, but now, now, now look at this. Uh, she can still see Bob because Bob sends a retarded, sends a light signal, you know, a retarded signal, from his future light cone, which is caught in Alice's future light cone. So to Alice, it looks like the like she's seeing backwards in time, because she's seeing stuff coming in from the future, back from the future. But everything is consistent. Okay. In any case, you know you have to learn how to think in terms of these visual images, and then it becomes you know once once you get okay, go to the next one, go to the next next slide. Okay, so here we go. Here is here's Elon Musk. He wasn't so stupid. I could draw the, the, this a little better, but this is uh, the blue line on the left is Earth, and, and it's going to Mars, right? So here you see the light. This is warp drive. The light goes going, going like that, and and to most of the trip, so much faster than light, and it gets there. It gets there in a very short amount of Earth time. But Alice is, you know, Alice is just uh, she's uh, aging normally. Everything's normal inside. You know, she's on a geodesic. She's weightless. But she's controlling her geodesic. Gotcha. That's what these that that's what we see the craft doing. That's what they're doing. Exactly how they do it. Now that's a you know. Okay, go to the next one. That's actually next we one. got one more at the very end of it. Here we go. This is it. That's this is the big one. This is the biggie. This is the one. This is time travel. The same thing. Which you control geodesic. You can go anywhere you want in space time. Any way you want to go, man. <laughs> now you got to be careful. You want to, you see, they're what are called closed time like curves. And the normally, when, when Kip Thorne, you read the books about time travel and the why time travel can't happen, because they they gave the right answer to the wrong question again. All these guys are what are called intelligent fools. Einstein called intelligent fools. They. They don't ask, they don't, yeah, John Wheeler used to say, the question is, what is the question? You gotta know what question to ask. If you ask a stupid question, you get the right answer to a stupid question. So everything you see, the, uh, everything you see Kirkpatrick and all these, everything you see Chris Mel, any of these people, they're saying, they're all at best, they're giving the right answers to the wrong questions, or in some cases, they're so stupid, that giving the wrong answers to the wrong questions. Right. But they're not giving the right answer to the right question. Okay. But here's the thing. If you're dumb, if you're stupid, and you do this, you have your warp drive, if you try to go back to exactly where you left, it's like closing a circuit. You know, it's like closing a circuit. Yeah. That's called the closed timeline curve. And if you do that, you will generate an instability and you will destroy the, the whole thing will blow up. Because what happens is the the light the photons get trapped. They go around an infinite number of times. Every time they go around, they build up energy, and it's but it's called an instability. So this is what Hawking called the um, the chronology protection. He was trying to say he had a, a, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking had this ongoing friendly debate with Kip Thorne that uh, uh, Hawking would say no, time travel is impossible because if you try, as soon as, as soon as you have a warp drive or a wormhole or a stargate, that's a time machine to go backwards in time, you create this instability because you have a closed timeline curve. That's very simple. You just don't go back to where you came. You give it a little, a little separation. You keep the circuit open. And then, it, then okay. Right. So in any case, that's what I claim. Now, so the point is this. Once you can control gravity, that means you can control the orientation of your of the ship's light cone with respect to the light cones of the external universe. Okay, right. and once you can do that, you know it's like Q. Do you ever see you know Star Trek Q? Oh God, yeah. You know the Q continuum is like that. By the way, by the way, Eugene, everything in Star Trek is basically a fact. Yeah, it is that way. And you know what? 
<laughs> Gene Roddenberry was part of a group, which I was part of, though we didn't we didn't actually physically we were part of around Andrea Paharich and these other spooks, intelligence spooks, who knew you know who drafted me into the project. He was he Gene Roddenberry was given real classified information yeah. that he fictionalized. They wanted him to do this deliberately. Yeah. The same is true for Steven Spielberg and all these guys, all these movies. Basically, all these science fiction movies, that you should, we should call them science faction movies, they were just softening up the public. So now when it's revealed, I mean, most people won't give a damn, right? Most people, yeah. <laughs> we knew this already. It's just like Star Trek. Okay? Yeah. So I love saying, to call them documentaries. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Whatever you want to call yeah. them. So, now, if uh, I but, could bring one the, thing into this, Jack, is kind of what we're yeah. talking about here is, you know, on Earth, we've barely been able to master the power of nuclear energy let alone fusion what we're dealing with is a civilization that has mastered the power of a black hole if not more no in fact that's wrong no see you you don't have, you don't understand what i'm talking about yet i got you, you don't get it because you don't know the math if i could if i could draw the equation i could explain it to you no that's not it this is all done with very small amounts of power right you don't need a lot of power to do this that's why it works Gotcha. So small you amount in, big effect, instead of big energy small amount, and big small effect. effect. Right. Well, the current theory of gravity, okay, that's good, okay, that's good. The current equations of gravity that all the big shots, the pundits, the guys at Cambridge and MIT, they, they, all the big relativists, they're very good mathematicians, don't get me wrong. Ed Witten, oh, the Princeton, Advanced Institute, all those guys, okay? Gravity is a, how do you say you need a big buck for a small bang. That's ordinary gravity. However, the lesson of the UFO is that they're getting a big bang for a small buck. Exactly. That's correct. Okay. So that's right. a good way of putting it. So, of course, the Pentagon won't like that because it becomes, oh, oh I'll tell you one reason why. That, why. Okay. Now, the Republicans on the Intelligence Committee, I know why they don't want this to go public. Tell us. Yeah, I just told you the reason. Because if Hamas, if Iran, if Kim Un Jong, North Korea, once they realize they could use AAA batteries to power their spaceships or their, their missiles or whatever, their craft, <laughs> Anybody can do it. Any terrorist can do it. So this is a real problem, actually. So I'm not sure if I'm for disclosure. When I so something this. from phenomenal power from the size of a blender, if not the size of a AAA battery. What? What's that? Something with phenomenal cosmic power from the size of a AAA battery. No, is what you're, you're just saying. Under, you just got it all wrong. That's not what I said. I said just the opposite. Phenomenal power from that's, something that's why very so small. I'm frustrated. Talk to you, talk to people. They don't get. You know, I'm talking and they don't understand it. You realize how frustrating that is. <laughs> Who was that? You, you, you got to you, get this guy off my bed. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Yeah. No, you just got exactly. I said the opposite. You need a small amount of power to get a big gravitational That's what I said. Effect. Phenomenal well, power from said, something like super, super small. Say that again, say it again. Something that's phenomenal in power from something that's so, super small and minor. That's what you're saying. Yeah, okay, no, because what threw me off, you say power. See, gravity, The power. when I use the word power, I mean the electromagnetic field yeah. input. So so the output, the, the, in other words, I want to have a strong gravity field output. I want the output. Small to input, the huge output. Yes, yes. Now, if you yeah. said that, okay, but say... So the, the way to say it is small electromagnetic field input, or say small voltage, like, okay, small battery voltage, electromagnetic, right? Small electromagnetic input for a large gravity output. Bingo. Yes. And right now, they have it the opposite way. So I'm like, you know, flipping it over, okay? Yeah. And now how to do that, now I, I know how to do it, you know, in principle, how to do it, practically speaking, uh, I the best way of doing that, of course, would be uh, for me to get uh, 
with my friend who has worked on it before to go back to the machine. Hopefully the machine will like me. I think the machine will like me because they contacted me when I was a kid anyway, right? The other thing, you know, there's a, let's not forget that, why do I know this? Why is Jack Sarfati doing this and nobody else? Because Jack Sarfati, you know, was contacted by these these things back in 1953. They told me I was going to do this. That's the other part. That's the high strangers part. That's the parent, right? None of this is happening randomly. No. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. You what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not only that, 1953, they told me what was going to happen in 1973 <laughs> when I met Hal Putoff. And Russell Tog and Uri Geller and Andre, all these guys, you know, all the CIA stuff, you know. And you can hear, actually, it turns out the CIA recording in 1973, some of it is on the internet. But that that's the my... year they brought me into this, 73, when I was freaking five years old. Okay, well, that may be. So, yeah. But if you go on SoundCloud, do Jack Sarfati CIA SoundCloud, yeah. you'll hear. You'll hear me at Stanford Research Institute with meeting Russell Tog and talk, talking about the computer on board the spacecraft yeah. from 1953. I talk about what happened to me, and then you hear Russell Tog say, "They're time flying us at time traveling machines from the future." <laughs> Russell Tog says it. Yeah. Okay. And then we have this guy Michael Masters today. You know about Michael Masters, right? Yeah. He's an anthropologist in, in Montana, and he using uh, the information. Um, he's an evolutionary biologist, and he has now said he doesn't know any physics. I mean, he, he doesn't really know, but he's not a physicist. But he comes to the same conclusion. Says, well, they must be coming back from the future, and he has very good reasons in terms of evolutionary biology and the data we have. And, and so everything Michael Masters says, who's coming from a different scientific discipline, coming to the same conclusion I came to through two different uh, methods of science all converging on the same final result. That's that's good science. That's good. That's yeah. very good. Okay. Absolutely. If I can, Neil Carr has had his hand up and he's been waving yeah, his God, hand Neil, tremendously Neil. for a while. Neil. <clears throat> oh my God. Um, and I don't even know like where what question to go to first. But sir, um, you got one. I really appreciate you being on the show. And uh, wow, what what an amazing. Um, um, talk so far um so i guess i'll start with this is it my understanding that time doesn't exist the way we think it does that basically all time is happening right now it's more okay, yeah, okay, a- that, that, forget that you know what i know all about that's that new age stuff in a sense <laughs> it's true in a sense it's true but it's too vague it's it's not precise enough what you okay. have to do you have to speak you have to learn sarfati language okay which is Einstein language. You have to learn the way a physicist thinks about it because physics is precise, it's mathematical, it's beautiful, it's elegant. And what you have to learn is these light cone diagrams. Once you understand what Roger Penrose has done, then everything becomes trivial. And in a sense, what you say is true in, in that what it says is any any period of the universe is during any time is accessible to us. Is reaching. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. So is it yeah. more, is it, does toroidal math have factor into this? Like the, the, do you, do you know about uh, Tesla's, uh, when yeah. you okay, said. Now, now, okay, now, okay. You know what? Forget all yeah. that. Okay. The whole idea, first of all, one of the things you learn if you want to be a good physicist, by the way, there's a really good set of lectures by this guy, Gerardus Tehoft, on how to be a theoretical physicist. And as John Wheeler says, you want to reduce excess baggage. As Einstein said, here's what Einstein says. Einstein says, any intelligent fool, that could be a very smart, high IQ person, any intelligent fool can make something much more complicated than it need be, okay? It takes a stroke of genius to go the other direction. Okay, now when I was at Cornell, when I was at Cornell, 1950s, they went there 56 to 60, and then was there in the early 60s again. And these are the guys who built the atomic bomb with Oppenheimer. These are Oppenheimer's. You know, this is, if you look at the movie Oppenheimer, you know, Hans Bethe, Richard Feynman, you know, all these guys, Phil Morrison. Uh, these were my professors. 
They had just come, it was 10 years after the war, 11 years after the war. They were just building the goddamn atomic bomb. They did it in three years, amazing project, the Manhattan Project. So these were no nonsense people, okay? And I was, it was drilled into me, more physics, less math, okay? Yeah, or as Einstein, make it as simple as possible, but not simple then as possible. So I don't need any, I don't, I may, uh, this toroidal the, 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 the thing, actually Penrose says, it may come in, but for what I'm talking about, we don't need anything complicated like that. We don't need string theory or any bullshit like that. It's all very simple. You have to, it's basically high school mathematics. Basically, all you need to know is trigonometry, algebra, you have to be good at algebra, you have to be good at trigonometry, you know your trig trigonometric identities and all that. You have to know that. And you have to know differential calculus and some integral calculus. And that's almost all you really have to know. Well, you have to have some tensors, you have to have a little linear algebra, you, know, you have to know a few things, but you don't have to go be very advanced in mathematics. It's basically any uh, undergraduate uh, physics course saying the first three or four years you probably get enough math to understand everything I'm saying is quite elementary from you know you see a lot of these papers published in theoretical physics all these you know you don't know what the hell they're talking about and even if you knew what they're talking about, it's not important anyway it's like it's like uh, Laputa you know, uh, governor's travels with these you know they're very brilliant people they're doing this great math it's good art it's good mathematics but it has very little impact on anything in the real world, on, on experiments or on engineering. Well, sir, forgive me for uh, interrupting. Yeah, but, Neil, um, but you've, the, I know you want to keep on going here, Neil, but we've got a bunch of other people with their hands up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Brian, you have your hand up, my friend. Yeah, Dr. Safardi, thank you so yeah. much for coming on. Sarafati. Saraf wait, wait. Spell it correct. I pronounce it. It's Sarafati. Sarafati. So far, Sorry, no I'm a, R. It's no I'm R. a white guy here in the Southwest. I'm rough on that. But <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so my point in question is, is if we look at a neutrino, which is nearly waste, weightless, that can pass through some solid object. Yeah, yeah it's irrelevant. Uh, Forget uh, neutrino. Well, it has, well, nothing, well, has nothing to yeah. do with what I'm saying, talking about. Nothing. No, no, do. correct. But I want to tie it into the ICBM conversation with the gravity lasers as well that pass through concrete. If you had a gravitate, so I'm not saying go massless, but like no, no, no. you yeah, said yeah, in earlier time, is, you, 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 you manipulate get... gravity, you take mass down to zero, then you can pass through solid objects. No, 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 no. It's all, you got, you're, you're very confused. What you're saying is wrong. It's not even wrong. It's so confused, it's not even wrong. First, it has nothing to do with neutrinos, and you don't want to change mass. Let me, oh, now, now, unfortunately, some very smart people, including Hal Putoff, some people, you will see all this thing, and this guy, Saul Paez, if you see anybody in the UFO field, if you see, talking about inertial mass reduction, forget it. That guy doesn't understand what the fuck he's talking about. Because let me tell you something. You know what an atomic bomb is? You know what an explosion is? It's inertial mass reduction. An atomic bomb, I forget, it's a very small percentage of the inertial mass is converted into energy, and you have a Hiroshima blast. I mean, that's that's the real trick, right, is that the only way to reduce mass is to convert mass into energy. No, and you, and you and, and what you said is you're not getting my idea either, no. So what are you, you, leave, what are you, you saying? You leave fucking mass alone. You don't <laughs> no, 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 I'm saying... Mass. You don't fuck with the mass. You fuck with the mass <laughs> and you destroy everything. Exactly. And that's why I'm saying you mess with the gravity via the gravity. Now, wind wait a minute. Just, to the just ICBM stop. coupler. Just that's stop. how it passes just through. Everyone mass. stop just listening stop. to Jack. No, you don't know what, you know, just stop and listen to me, okay? <laughs> You're here to listen to me. I'm not here to listen to you. You're here to listen to me, okay? This is like the military. I'm the general and you're the goddamn private, okay? Now listen, seriously, that's academia, okay? When I was at Cornell, I didn't interrupt Hans Bethe to give him my stupid ideas. I had a lot of stupid ideas, okay? I listened to Professor Beta, okay? <laughs> right, so now, people confuse weight with mass. In elementary physics, weight is a product of the inertial mass also called gravity mass, inertial mass times the acceleration of gravity, the acceleration field of gravity, okay? So what the, what, what the ship is doing, it's not changing inertial. You change the inertial mass, and you're going to blow up the goddamn laboratory, if not, you know, the country. You have a super bomb. 
That's not nuclear bombs, and even even TNT. What TNT is? It's converting a little bit of the inertial mass in the electronic atomic binding energies of the molecules. It's converting a little bit of that binding energy, uh, or that the mass involved. It's releasing some of that binding energy, and it creates an explosion. If you do it very fast, you get it powerfully, you know, like TNT. Okay. So what you leave the mass alone. You don't want to change the mass. But you do change the gravity. That's what I'm talking about, how to change the gravity. That's Einstein's gravity field equation. So you have two variables, m, g. You don't screw with m. And anybody who says that is stupid and doesn't know his physics or has made a really dumb mistake and should not be listened to. As soon as you see inertial mass reduction, that guy's an idiot. That, uh, you know, forget it. That's wrong. <laughs> and if he had a way of changing the mass, he's going to play, it's going to be, it's, a, it's very dangerous. It, the, then right away, the Homeland Security Department should come in and confiscate. The FBI should come in and take away his laboratory and put him in Leavenworth, put him in a padded cell. <laughs> so, but let's get back to the point. That may be why the Republicans don't want to have disclosure. And that could be a valid reason now that I think about it. And that may be. That may be why Chris Mellon has even said something like that. I've been told. I haven't heard him say it. But the thing is, is it's too late because I've already put everything, everything's out on the Internet. And the Russians know what I'm doing because the Russians invited me to Moscow. So it's too late. The Pandora's box is already open. Hopefully, the only thing that will stop terrorists or Hamas or, uh, from doing it in, in the underground tunnels in, in Gaza, say, is that the... Condensed matter physics is very sophisticated. You know, it's nanotech. You need uh, IBM. You need Google Labs. You need you know, Apple Computer. You know, all these uh, Intel. Uh, um, you know, um, IBM. You need. You'll need very sophisticated teams of really bright. And it's a, it'll be a massive. I think it'll be a massive project. I, I doubt that anybody. Except oh well, here's the thing. Except that see now it's the AI. Now we have the, you know the whole thing with. Sam Alt. By the way, Sam Altman's my next door neighbor. You know who Sam Altman is? GPT. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, he's my next door neighbor. Oh literally. wow. But he's he's in the house next door. Uh, I haven't met him yet. My 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 lady who owns the house knows him. Yeah, you because know, he moved in recently, and and he's away a lot. And I'm in London. I'm hopping here myself. Right. But but uh, what what everything that Altman's doing, and even even Elon Musk, they're all and Google, they're all getting into this uh, super AI. Now, with the super AI being um, modified for metamaterial research, and you know, there's this guy Prasad. Prasad, uh, you know, he's up in the general materials. He's up in Toronto. This kid, this 26-year-old kid, is able to con millions of dollars into this thing. But he, uh, he's trying to do this. He's trying to use AI to design the metamaterials. And in other words, I give it the specs. I, I say, okay. I, I talk to the computer. In fact, I, yeah, I talk to the AI, and I say, I need a metamaterial that's going to have a dielectric permittivity of uh, a relative dielectric permittivity, which is a pure number, relative dielectric permittivity of 10 to the 16. Can you make, design me a metamaterial that can do that? Well, if they're able to do that, then we're in. Then we can do this. Now, and let me mention one thing before we, we end this thing. Uh, the... You know what Lawrence Livermore Lab is? Lawrence Livermore Lab used to be part of Berkeley. The E.O. Lawrence, who's in the movie Oppenheimer, Lawrence is Oppenheimer's buddy, if you see the movie. Uh, it's now run by the Department of Energy. It's part of Los Alamos, but it's here near, near me. It's a few miles away in Livermore. And it's the nuclear weapons. It's Edward Teller. Edward Teller, who I knew. Edward Teller's lab. He's dead now. And that's where they design and test nuclear weapons. Well, guess what? For three years, they, without telling me, I, they, I found out only a couple of months ago, they've been testing my equations, or they've been, they've been playing with my equations, you know, to convert electromagnetism into gravity, okay? And I don't think, they haven't done it, uh, they have a proposal, you know, this is Department of Energy, this is the right? They're willing to bet well, $250 million of tax money Two hundred fifty million dollars. Other, it'll have other uses too, partly to test the Jack Sarfati equation. For what we're talking about, okay? And they've calculated, assuming you know, if my this is a test of that was a seed, that one is it, is it true or not? Okay, maybe I'm wrong. 
See, all good physics has to be proper falsifiable. That has to be testable. So they have a machine. They, they want to build. I don't know if they have the machine yet or they're parts of the machine. They want to build a machine that's 60 feet by 30 feet. Now it goes, you know, some huge monster Frankenstein. They call it the warp fusion reactor. And they're shooting around. They're shooting these hot, heavy ion plasma beams, okay? Two counter beams colliding the beams. Beams intersect. And inside, they claim it'll form a small warp bubble, warp like a warp bubble, of uh, 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 a self-consistent like gravitational field. In a volume, it's about one ten millionth of a cubic meter, and it's going to create a G field, equivalent gravity field of sixteen thousand times the Earth's gravity field. The Earth's gravity acceleration is like 9.8 meters per second squared. This thing in this little bubble is going to have a, 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 um, uh, you know, a gravity field 16,000 times the strength of gravity at the surface of the Earth. In other words, if you, if you were little guys sitting in that bubble, you would weigh 16,000 times your Earth weight. <laughs> you know, all right. But, uh, they say, and this has the parameter that I need, this has the param parameter I need, what's called the dielectric permittivity uh, that they're generating, they think. I don't know how that, you know, that's, that's, that's their, I mean, this is physics, I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming they know what they're doing. They're generating uh, what's called the dielectric permittivity of 10 to the 16th power. So that's like, uh, that's like 10,000 trillion, 10,000, uh, 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 they're amplifying Okay, the weak coupling, Einstein's field equation, there's a weak coupling that has the dimensions of one over force, you know, in, in the, what are called the MKS system or the SI system. You measure force in Newtons of force. So the coupling of electromagnetic fields to gravity fields in Einstein's theory is only 10 to the minus 43 reciprocal Newtons. Very small number. That fraction, that coupling, that number gets amplified by 32 powers of 10, which means that the coupling is no longer 10 to the minus 43 reciprocal newtons. It's, it's 10 to the minus 11 reciprocal newtons. And actually, that's pretty strong. That's pretty strong. And actually, that's much more than we need to fly, that we see these ships flying around. They don't need to the stuff that powerful. That, that's like super powerful, but that's, you know, it's the government $250 million experiment. Okay. So the point is that this is very real stuff now. This is technology that's, you know, coming online. It's, 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 I don't know if they're going to get funded. They probably will. I'm sure that, you know, I'm, because that'll test the basic, that'll test the basic theory that I had back in 2011, you know, back in 2011. Okay. Question. Let's take some questions. Absolutely. David Dominic, you've had your hand up for a while, my friend. Dominigas, I should say. David, you need to unmute yourself. Hi, Jack. It's good to see you. Uh, it's David Hooper. Oh, David. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Where's Question your image? You. Where's your picture? I want to see what you look like. Oh, I, I don't have it on right now, but um, can hopefully you I can meet on? you in person. Yeah, I don't have my webcam. You don't have a webcam. But either, what, what do you that's want, all right. Phone? I just have the microphone. So, what, but what are you using? Are you using a computer? Uh, just an old computer I have. Oh, and doesn't have a webcam? Jesus, what, are you broke or something? <laughs> Super broke. What are, you, are, you, are you using an IBM, what, an IBM 360 or something? <laughs> no. Yeah, it's an old computer. Oh, but quick question for you. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Where in space and time where, would you go? if the uh, conscious AI on board the UAP would let you interface with it. What are you talking about? If I could time travel anywhere I want to go? Exactly. I don't know. I think I think I, I think I want to go. Uh, <laughs> I think I just want to go to Kensington in London by the Kensington Palace where my flat is. <laughs> what do I want to, what, hey, listen, what, 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 you know, where do I want to go? I mean, do you think I want to go back and see Jesus Christ get crucified? They'll probably crucify me. I don't know. Maybe we could uh, go back in time and meet the non-human intelligence uh, running yeah. things back in the day. The point, uh, the point is this. 
I, I, I personally don't, don't – I personally want to stay uh, uh, in San Francisco. I want to be at my, my club in London with all my, uh, with all my eccentric uh, uh, fellow gentlemen at the club there, uh, drinking good wine, having good food. You know, and having interesting conversations. Uh, that's all I want to do. So I would just go back and forth between San Francisco and London myself. Or maybe I'd go to, I'd like to go to Rome, I'd go to Florence, you know. Uh, but uh, you see, you can't go back in time and change it. You can't, I couldn't go back in time and shoot Adolf Hitler, for example. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Fail. Unless or, that's where the Mandela I, effect comes from, yeah. you've heard about a lot of people have talked about before, you know, where it could be not coming from us, but coming from those who can manipulate time and space. Well, wait a minute. I'm telling you what I'm, what I'm, well, who's being done? I mean, I'm telling you everything we're seeing that that's manipulating time and space. What do you mean? Who can? We're seeing it. That's I, what, well, it's not, us, that's, what? it's not us, but what? It's not us, but we're seeing it. We're seeing it. Yeah, well, you know, yes, uh, yes, right. Uh, no, see, if it's not the Russians, I know it's not the Russians, because for several reasons, it's actually, somebody gave a really good reason, it was the other day. Uh, oh, yeah, because even back in 1940, they were seeing these things. They're seeing what we're seeing now. And back even before 1940, nobody had that kind of technology. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. But the thing is, this, uh, if, if it was the Russians... If it was the Russians, they would not have invited me to Moscow last July. Because they already know. Of course, the Russians don't. Uh, I don't even know why they invited me. Because they, you know, uh, the Russians have been tracking my stuff. I, I have a whole history with Russia. You know, back because I, I, uh, I helped set up the Strategic Defense Initiative with uh, Ronald Reagan's people back then. So the Russians, you know, the Russians know who I am. Yeah. My sister and brother-in-law worked on that at TRW back in the day. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's all. So, but but if the Russians had it, I don't think they would invite me unless they wanted me to come and would not let me go back. <laughs> it's a possibility. <laughs> but if Putin, okay, well, actually, Putin, okay, Putin doesn't have to use it right now because he's already winning with conventional. Okay, but if if he was suddenly to start losing, then if he had it, he would use it. But I don't think they have it. I don't. I don't think China has. It. I don't think anybody has it yet. Excellent. Good points, my friend. If I may, uh, next person has their hand up. Uh, William, phase will. Yeah. Hey, yeah, Jack. Um, what's up? Yeah. Hey, man, I'm not, a, I, I don't know shit. I'm just trying to, you know, find out information. Yeah, I'm not smart. Well, I don't know shit. Um, all right, don't, wait, don't, don't tell me I'm stupid. You are. All right. All right. I'm, I'm not saying I'm stupid. I said I don't know. It's two different yeah, things. All right. All right. So let me, let me ask a question. Um, yeah. So, <sighs> Yeah, this was Al Kabir, right? Drive. What's the yeah, challenge yeah, yeah. of it? What, what's the challenge yeah. of it? What's the challenge of it, sir? Appreciate you. What's, what's the challenge of it? Yes, yeah. yes. I don't know what the what are you asking? Oh, you mean why can't we do it? Right. Oh, okay. Well, first of all, the, the Al Kabir, uh, uh, it's only a toy model. It's not. It's not. You know. It's not. It's in fact. Oh, in fact. Okay. I have a a guy I work with named Jose Rudell. But it's a, it's a yeah, it's, it's an advanced paper. He's just coming out with a paper showing how the uh, many of the papers that are published on the Alcubierre effect have made serious errors. And uh, Jose's paper, which is just out now in the journal General Relativity and Gravitation, he corrects some of those errors. Yeah. Um, and again, the thing that's stopping things like the Alcubierre drive is what I've said: the energy that it, that they didn't know how to. It's everything I've been talking about here, that when the guys who who publish these papers, they think you need a very big buck to get a small bang, and the bang is too small to generate the drive. I'm saying no, it goes the other way around. We can get the very big bang for a very small buck, and we can have the drive. In fact, that's what we see these things flying around. That's what they're doing. So yeah, I, this com I have a slide up from your presentation where you're yeah. saying, and you point yeah. out point two is requires a lot of negative energy density. But what you're saying is you need a little bit of energy to get a big buck yes. out of it. Yeah, what I'm saying is that, that that statement is wrong. That's what people think. 
that needs a, a lot of negative energy. It actually needs a very tiny amount of negative energy. That's a wrong statement. That, that's the conventional group think right there. It's not what's true. That's what I'm saying is not true. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so you have, to get, you have to get the context right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, thanks for your question, uh, uh, Will. Uh, Lee, you have your hand up, my friend. Good evening, Jack. How are you doing? Yeah. I know you've been doing this for a minute, and thank you for uh, drudging through it. I, I wanted to ask a question that you could enlighten us about in regards to the difference between the wave properties of photons and phonons and how the electromagnetic wave of a photon versus the atomic oscillatory wave of a phonon and the tunneling properties that a phonon can represent through different materials. Now, I don't know. Uh, now I, your question is not very precise. At first, I feel you were asking me about the wave particle duality. You know, how could something be a, a wave and a particle at the same time? And I thought that was your question, but apparently... I'm asking, you, I'm asking you to educate us the difference between the photon and the phonon and how quantum properties relate to both. Okay. No, okay, a pho- uh, the very, okay. Just go to Wikipedia... And look on the, the uh, look look at the uh, at the uh, paper on quasi quasi particles. Okay, now the photon is a vibration of the electromagnetic field. Okay, the phonon is a vibration of um, you know of uh, molecules and atoms in a crystal. Sound. So the phonon is a quantum of sound, and the photon is a quantum of light. So that's it. Now what happens is. If you send a photon into a crystal, then you can, what's called hybridization, you can, the photon, the photon and the phonon sort of get mixed up with each other, and you have what's called a quasi-particle. I forget which, which one that is, <laughs> but just look at Wikipedia. There, there's like a hundred of these different kinds of, all these different kinds of quasi-particles. Go to Wikipedia, look in the, it's a very interesting article, quasi-particles, see all these different things that happen in materials, and see, but that's the kind of stuff that we need to design the metamaterial to amplify the coupling of the, say, the input voltage and the output gravity field. Okay. Do you believe that there's a tunneling property involved with those nanomaterials and those metamaterials that, that has well, to be? Tunneling, a tunneling uh, I don't, that's too big. Tunneling is a quantum uh, tunneling happens in all over the damn place. Tunneling is just part of quantum quantum mechanics. Tunneling simply means if you have an energy, a classical energy barrier, and you have a quantum wave, there's a certain probability of going through it. But so yeah, that t- t- tunneling is all over the place. The tunneling is yeah, you know, well, our bodies yes, things are constantly tunneling. So tunneling is just you know, your, your question isn't precise enough. I don't know, what, you know. Yeah, oh, I apologize. It's, you're, it's, you're too, you're too, it's, you're too it's, smart for me, Jack. Obviously, yeah. I apologize. No no, no, no. But I mean, you don't know how to ask a question that that's of interest to a to a physicist. I mean, but what you should do is just you know do a little homework. And if you're asking, is quantum tunneling important? Yeah, very important. Is it happening? It happens all the time. It's happening all the time everywhere. It's a basic process of nature. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, Nick. You have your hand up, my friend. Yeah. Nick, so, come on. It's all right. It's just Jack. What? You had your hand up, Nick. What happened? Come on, Nick. Who's... I guess not. <laughs> all right. Uh, Neil Carr, your hand is up again, my friend. Yeah. Hi there uh, again. Um, so uh, when I was 15 um, and I'm turning 53 in 10 yeah. days, uh, I read a book called um, Space time and um and yeah. the, and everything or something like that it was table no, no, space and quantum space, physics no space time and beyond was it a comic book yeah 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 i wrote the, that book i was one of the authors of that book you're the t- you're the table napkin quantum theorist i'm the what the, it was described as table napkin quantum theory theory Oh no! Well, maybe it's a different book. There's a book no. Also- I think it's probably it's got to be the same book. Um, but uh, so there was a description of of matter being gravitationally trapped light. Yeah, that was me. That was stupid. That was <laughs> that's stupid. <laughs> I got to tell you, that's one of my favorite books that I can't. I know. I know. It was very life popular. Find. It sold. Okay, that that but you got to read how the hippies say physics. He talks about that. That's a very. I don't think I have time. It's a very funny story how that book came about. It's very funny. <laughs> I I have laughter in me. 
Yeah, no, no. It 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 created a lot. That book, that book was very popular in Hollywood. That book was a CIA operation. That book was part of the CIA operation, okay? That book created the movies Back from the Future, uh, uh, all kinds of movies, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, all these science fiction movies. That's so funny. Were, were, were triggered by that book, okay? Because also I used to hang out with, with Francis Ford Coppola. I was like his buddy, Francis Ford Coppola, back in the, in the 70s. And I had all his friends, you know, Spielberg, went to, went to his house, parties, and I introduced Jacques Vallée to them. And, yeah, you know, there's a whole... But you got to read how the hippie saved physics, but it's fun. But that book... Basically, okay, that book was a C, was a very successful central intelligence operation in which Jack Sarfati, and I'll, I will quote Gary Nolan, Jack Sarfati, what did he just say the other day? Gary Nolan, you know, he said, Jack Sarfati is a giant narcissistic fool. And in a way, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, because because we were, but you know, you know the the Parsifal, the Parsifal legend. How Parsifal? It's the whole Parsifal. It's like it's like the hero's quest. Uh, you know, uh, what's that guy that wrote the, those books about myth? Uh, uh, Joe, I can't, I can't think. Of. Any case, no. The point is, the point is, we didn't know anything then. Okay, we didn't know anything. That's when the CIA was selling us, Jack. We want you to figure out how consciousness works and how flying sources fly. And part of that project, they had this guy, Bob Toe, part of that project was to write these books. And we didn't know anything back then. Yeah, I was just saying, oh, what the hell are we know? We, I was just a very straight physics professor. <laughs> but what happened, they got us stoned on, 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 on uh, you know, I guess it was hashish, whatever. They got us stoned, we got very stoned. And we wrote that book totally stoned in 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 the Cafe du La Paix in Paris, <laughs> like La Wing. And we didn't know what the hell we we were just channeling. We didn't know. And it was just this this guy who was this guy um, Bob Tobin. It was me and Fred Allen Wolf, Bob Tobin. Bob Tobin was like the CIA guy in a way. And I don't know, I don't know if he realized it, but he he was financing it. He was an artist. He did the cartoons, and we were just like. You know, sitting around smoking dope. <laughs> they say, suppose you could bend metal with your mind. So, you know, they were just giving us the questions. And we were just like, God knows what, using what little we knew back then. And just, you know, just bullshitting our way. But it was done. It was, it was very it was commercially very successful. We didn't know shit then. Everything I said there was that. But what's her name? Uh, who's that, that actress wrote uh, Dancing in the Light? Oh, Dancing on, on, on you know, what, you know. What you know that the actress? Um, well, but I forget she was she's really good looking. Uh, so you know, and deep back sharper, all these guys. You know, we, we actually created a movement. You got to read how to be safe physics. The whole story's in there. Okay, so uh, in a way, it's very funny. The gods are laughing. The whole thing was. But now we really do know the real answer. You see, it took fifty years. It's like a quest, like the hero's quest. You know, you know, if you you got to read the story of Parsifal. Parsifal becomes king of the Grail. At first, he's an idiot. You know, he's he's he he he's shown all this stuff, but he's too stupid to realize what he's being shown. But finally, well, I would love to, I would love to meet you in Paris uh, someday in a cafe, and we could rewrite the book. How about that? No, well, no, I'm too busy for that. I don't have that. those days are over. Those right. days are. And he's, I'm mostly in London. I'm I, I don't go to Paris that much. I, I mostly I mostly you, hang out in London. You must be not there well, for I'm, the I'm curries. Irish, so yeah, that's out. You must okay, be in London you. for oh. the cur you must be in London for the curries, not the good national food. <laughs> or are you no, there? No, actually I, no 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 actually you probably have no London is uh, the food's quite good now because you know because uh, uh, you know because uh, before Brexit, you know, there was a lot of Europeans. It's French. I mean yeah. I just go I I live in Kensington near the Kensington Palace. I go out in the morning. There is a French patisserie. It's the same as in Paris. It's the French, the French, and he cooks. I my, it's like being in Paris. There's no difference. Yeah, what I'm saying is you're not there for the UK original food. 
<laughs> no, actually, that's not true because I you like to the, a you club. like the beans and the and the baked tomatoes and the well, yeah, no, well, gamey no, bacon. I, no, that's a little heavy. No, but I belong to a club. Uh, it's like a diner dining club in Mayfair. That uh, with the cook. I mean, it's you know, it's it's English food, but it's done very well. It's oh, there you go. It's done the French. You know, yeah, yeah, but no, no, the food in London is not bad. Actually, no. actually, the food in Europe is better than the food in California now. Pretty much. It's oh better. my gosh. <laughs> yeah, California. I mean, trust me, I've been States in Germany too many times, and their food is interesting to say the least. Well, yeah, because the food, the food in in England, and it, you know, comes from the local farms. A lot of it, you know, so it's pretty fresh. It's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, but let's not. Yeah, it's, that's absolutely. Topic. Nick, last question. Go ahead. Actually, but then we get back to Mike. Yeah. Come on, Nick. Okay, I'll, I uh, 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 Jack. Like, yeah. Like, I have a question for you. Uh, like, do you believe that the integrated circuit and the what? The integrated circuit. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, that that uh, Philip Corso said, I came from the like from the Roswell crash. Uh, do you believe that? I'm sorry, I ca- you're, you're so breaking up. Philip Corso came out and said that the integrated yeah. circuits, stuff like that, like fiber yeah. optics, Velcro, oh, yeah, yeah. Kevlar, yeah. came from the Roswell crash. Yeah, I I I I believe that. Yeah, I know there's I know that there's been a cover story. Just like the Roswell was a weather balloon. There's a cover story that it didn't happen that way. But if Phil Corso said it happened the way, I believe him because, number one, he's an officer and a gentleman. He has no reason to lie. And also, guess what? Now, I'm not 100%. I think I actually met Phil Corso when I was about 10 years old. Wow. About 1949, only about two or three years after Roswell. Because my grand, see, this is all very interesting. See, it's all interesting. It's all connected, yeah, because, isn't it? It's all connected. Yeah, because my grandfather worked for the army, and I was living with my grandparents, and my grandfather worked at the Army Quartermaster Corps near 14th Street in the Garment District in Manhattan. And I used to, you know, after school, and you know, I would go down and be with my gramps, you know, my grandfather. You know, he was fairly young actually, and. Um, so I would go down to where his, to his work, just like 1949, maybe 1950, okay? And they had the quartermaster corps had dev- different floors, and they had a, one floor was like tropical, you, you know, heat, the heat thing. Then they had for the cold, the polar thing, and all these like different laboratories where they're testing, you know, clothing, right? But here's this kid, I'm just a 10-year-old kid, and everything was pretty involved. I was... It was my playground. I used to go there. Yeah, I had. They let. I could wander anywhere I want. Do whatever. You play with the stuff. Put on the uniforms. Play with the stuff. And I was encouraged to do that. Okay, and then these officers would come, and I was a kid. I was reading science fiction. I wanted, you know, I wanted to build rockets and go to the moon and Mars, all that kind of stuff. And I mean, these I, these officers would come and talk to me. Then when I opened up, and yeah, it was a long time ago. It was like, you know, uh, God, it's 70 years ago already. And so, but then when I opened up the book, Phil Corso book, I saw his picture. And so, you know, that, I, think that's, I think that's the guy, one of the guys, uh, you know, it like rang a bell. That yeah. guy, I, knew, I knew this guy. He was older. I, ask I, think, that question? Back I think that was Phil Corso because they were talking to me about flying saucers. Gotta... Who, yeah. who, who in 1949 at the Army Quartermaster Corps in New York City, 1950, who's going to be talking to Jack Sarfati about flying saucers? Mm-hmm. Must have been Phil Corso, right? Yeah. And it looked like Phil Corso. And I said, so there we go. Yeah. I've got I another qu- question. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah. Then I've got one more from the audience. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, like, do you know um, who uh, uh, Salvador Payas is? Uh, yes. Yeah. I know exactly who he is, and his stuff is no good. It's shit. Uh, Bad. Bad physics. It's stupid. Yeah. And then what it is, what it is, it is a black mark, egg on the face of whatever naval officers funded that, because anybody who knows any physics right away would know right away that it's dumb. Now, Payas himself is a very sweet man, very nice. Don't get me wrong. He's a nice guy. He believes what he's doing. He's an engineer. But again, he does not understand theoretical physics. He understands 
you know, he's like an electrical engineer. He understands, you know, he's like the putter around. He can build, you know, he understands maybe certain circuit theory. He understands something, but he doesn't understand what you need to understand to know how to think about this stuff. And that is the problem. That is the problem. And the problem is that most people in the American uh, military uh, are, are, are stupid when it comes to physics. And the Russian military is not stupid when it comes to physics. They yeah. know the right stuff. And that's why uh, this is a real national security problem. And maybe and that's why that he got this from your It may be too late. Yeah. But maybe that could be why, uh, Jack, that Salvatore yeah. is actually going and support, supporting the whole MH370 kind of a thing that's out there. Well, that's stupid, too. Okay. Now, wait a minute. I mean, okay. Listen. Okay. About teleportation of, I mean, that guy, Ashton Forbes, he's a crackpot. I mean, he started getting, I, you know, I started asking him some questions and he got very, you know, I, that's how you know you have a crackpot. When he says, uh, you know, he, you know he, when he starts to script, I, I, yeah, sometimes I guess I sound like a crackpot. I gotta be careful. No, but wait, but seriously, the general issue of teleportation of light, like the Philadelphia experiment, okay, it's public, the Philadelphia experiment, uh, actually, that's real. I think I, yeah. that, that really, I have all kinds of reasons that I have several different intel. You know, I have, I have, you know, like people who were there told yeah. me. Uh, I, I, I have sources for that. You, but, but if you know, know, this sources. comes in from Luke in the background, mind. Luke just came now, in now, here and now, said, now, "Well, if Salvatore finish, is so." Let, cr- let, let, let me finish the goddamn thought, huh? <laughs> you guys, that's the problem with all you, you guys here. You know, I'm in mid sentence and I get interrupted. I, I forget what I was talking about. The um, the the thing that the MH370 talks about that could happen. I'm not saying it's not, that's a portal. The thing disappearing through a, a Stargate portal. That, that and, you know, that's what Ryan Graves. That's what that that sphere. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the cube inside the sphere, that's a that's a portal. That's a Stargate portal. The ship can go through that thing. Well, the, the, in this case, maybe an aircraft can. So uh, I do know things about very large military equipment being teleported. I do know things about that, but I can't go into detail. Whether it happened in that particular case, there's all kinds of stuff. They're saying that the, the videos they're showing are fake CGI videos. You know, and so um, whether it happened in that case, my guess is it didn't. My guess is that's fake. But that doesn't mean that that kind of thing cannot happen. Yeah. Okay. So it's tricky. Absolutely. So if Salvatore Pius is an idiot, where does it leave Neil deGrasse Tyson? He's not an idiot. He's but he's stupid. Okay, he so if he's stupid, him. where does that put Neil deGrasse he's Tyson? He's smart. He's, he's an intelligent fool. He's 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 smart, but he's also stupid. Look, I've been I'm very stupid about things myself. You know, yeah. I mean, we're complex creatures. You can be smart in one thing and stupid in something else. He's stupid in what he needs to know to try to do what yeah. he's trying to do. What he's doing is so obviously stupid. Every phys- even Eric Davis, who we disagree with, so any competent, any any physicist with a certain minimal level of competence can tell right away that that guy, those patents are ridiculous. Absolutely. I, listen, I, if, I, if I'm proven wrong, then I'll, I'll retract. <laughs> but, but, if I, you know, it's obviously dumb to me, okay? And, and the scandal is that the Navy funded it. The scandal yeah. is that there weren't enough people in wherever he's working to tell him to shut up and go or fire him. <laughs> That's Absolutely. What the is. T and then back to Mike. T. Hey Jack, how you doing? So with your earlier conversation about the threats of technology being involved yeah. with, you know, North Korea, yada yada yada. Yeah. What, do you ever see the plausible management of this technology or where do you see it heading if if ever in, into the direction of mainstream sort of use? You know what? Mainstream doesn't matter. Everybody, it's all irrelevant. It only takes a few competent scientists with private money to do the whole thing. And in fact, I think that's the way it's going to happen. The government can't look. Do you saw what they did with COVID? You saw what they did when Obama tried to do a website to get everybody to register for Obamacare? You saw how they fuck it up? 
They're stupid. The people, and you just listen to Tucker Carlson, who lived with these people. They're all the. What, America is fallen. We don't have an America anymore. America is split apart. You know, we're polarized. We're we're bankrupt. We have a thirty-three trillion dollar debt. It's all going to come crashing down. There is no stability here. Yeah, you know, people think right now, but it's like the frog in the in, in the thing, and we're pretty much dead now. You know, the water's get, getting very hot, and most people are so stupid. You think there's going to even be an American government a year from now? Well, maybe, maybe not. Good you don't point. know that. Yeah. You know, so, so the only way, the the only, I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, may hopefully these ETs will come down and save us from ourselves. Yeah. Because what we're doing, you know, we're screwing up badly, very badly. This thing, you know, we're on the brink of a nuclear war with Russia. That's stupid. We didn't have to have that war. You know, Putin was pushed into this war. It's not his fault. It's the fault of, of Joe Biden. Yeah. Okay, I was at a place called Bohemian Grove years ago, where a lot of powerful people go. And Robert Gates was giving a lecture there. This is back in maybe 2017, you know. And Robbie Gates was the former Secretary of Defense. This is a place where you have all these generals and admirals and CIA directors and senators and presidents. You know, they, I mean, Richard Nixon would go there, George Bush, but George Bush, Clint Eastwood, I mean, all these famous people hanging out in the woods. And we're up this beautiful lake, lakeside talk. And somebody asks Gates, what do you think of Joe Biden? Gates, Robert Gates says, and I, would, I didn't know what the fight says. Every foreign policy decision that Joe Biden was ever involved with or supported has ended in complete unmitigated disaster. And that's the, what we're seeing that in Ukraine right now. Yeah. Okay. So they're going to do anything. And by, and by the way, I, you know, I'm an independent now. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I mean, you know, there, you know, there's corruption on both sides. Yeah. Corruption on both sides. Think for so, yourself. You expect, if you expect the government to do anything, they can't even calculate their way out of a paper bag, for Christ's sake. They're so incompetent. They can't even account for what? How many trillion dollars the Pentagon? Three trillion dollars they can't account for? So you expect the government to do it? No. If anybody's going to do it, it'll be uh, Elon Musk if he, you know, listen to yeah. me. Elon Musk could do it. Jeff Bezos can do it. I, I know some other people maybe who can do it. Um, whose names I'm not going to mention. And uh, so if anything's going to be done, it'll be done privately. Assuming we don't blow ourselves up, or assuming we even have an election in 2024. Now, what's happened? We have an open border. We've let all these young military men, military age men, and the cartels and gangsters and, and sleeper agents come through the border. We're going to have a 9-11, a, a super 9-11 probably before the election, to screw up the election. That's going to probably happen in the next few months. Oh, gosh. So, so you know, that's another reason I want to live in London. But uh, but the point, even London, they, uh, London's just, they're just as stupid in London yeah. as they are here. They went along with them. So yeah. we're, in a very, we're in a crisis situation right now. Things are not normal. And they're well, not going to, you know, with, you know, so, you know, you can't assume even in five, ten, like this guy, Colonel Nell, the guy at Gary's, you know, the soul meeting just had, he's giving a six-year, ten-year plan. That's stupid. There may not even be a country. We may be all, you know, in a, in a nuclear, I mean, we may be all dead. Almost everybody dead but, by then. But if you look at this from a science standpoint, right now we're getting ready to go through a huge solar cycle. Do you think that we have had the science or the tech to possibly protect us from the sun if it flares up like they're saying it could? Uh, I didn't, well, I don't know. I haven't followed that. I hope it's, uh, no, we don't. What will happen is, in that case, uh, if that's the case, the super rich, you know, they already they're have bunkers, right? You know, they're, they're bunkers yeah. uh, underground. So what will happen, you know, maybe a few thousand, if a, maybe a million people will survive, a couple million, if they're lucky, will survive. And uh, that's the end of it. That's it. It's over. Now, that may be why these flying saucers are here. and I mean, they, they permit it. I don't know. I'm giving worst case scenario. I mean, I hope it doesn't happen. Yeah. But I'm not, if I, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm 84 years old, so I don't really give a shit. But, you know, I have friends and, you know, who are young people. And so for them, yeah. it's, it's pretty bad. I mean, I, you know, I had a good ride. But anybody who's, uh, see, no, and there's nothing we can do about it except hope, hope 
hope that they're friendly ETs that you know they'll come down like you know the day the Earth stood still and land. You know, hopefully, you know that's one that's one way out. Yeah. Otherwise, I, don't, I think we've run out of time. Yeah. Myself, Talking about running out of time, Mike. Yeah, like, more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, back to you. Mike. Going once. I think Mike, Mike is depressed and took a and took a. No, pill Mike has a, got like <laughs> kids and a wife around. So hey, Mike, are you there? Hey, Thomas. He took a sign, I Mike has I his. Depressed, <laughs> I, well, I depressed him too much. <laughs> oh, not at all. He's got tied up with something else going on. I'm sure. But anyway, Jack, it's been a great conversation with you yeah. tonight. The audience has been lit about the conversation. I love your candor, the way you look at stuff. I hope I hope you you'd be happy to come back with us and talk again because yeah, sure. If 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 we're if we're all alive, we'll be alive. If we're alive. <laughs> At least well, next so month, you never day know where we could be down the road. A day at a time, day at a time. <laughs> Absolutely. On that note, I want to go ahead and thank everybody for coming out with a great episode of Disclosure tonight. Holy cow, what a great show, what a great audience. There's been great support for Disclosure tonight, including some people, some super chats tonight, including UK Cosmic Dave, Waga Boss. Thank you very much. Uh, who else? I need to go back to YouTube. There's been a bunch of other great super chats from everybody else right now. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. The list didn't stay up. I apologize, my friends, and all that note. I want to thank everybody for coming out. More importantly, I want to thank Dr. Jack Safardi. Thanks for coming out tonight, Jack. Okay, and uh, is this going to be on YouTube? Will you post you know, it on- we've, been on, we've been live on YouTube all night. Okay, but now if people who want to watch it later, they can see it. Oh, gosh, yes. We play it as many okay. times as we can. Yeah, okay, because that's, that's where most people are watching. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, but uh, we've already had uh, 1,211 views. There's 400 people uh, four hundred people still watching us live right now. They've okay. loved your conversation, everything that you've had to say so far tonight. It's been a great okay, audience. I, you know, it's great to get to know you in this conversation. Okay. And I'd, I love your candor. You, you've been an amazing person. Well, my yeah, friend. I'm just, at, I'm, I'm, a, I'm from New York. I'm just a New Yorker, you know. I'm a New Yorker. Yeah. You know, I told you. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just someone yeah. from Illinois, so how about that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jack, I just want to say thank you. Um, yeah. I really appreciate yeah. uh, your conversation tonight. Okay, well, I think I, was, I try to tell the truth. I try to tell the truth as I see it. Yes. You know, I could be mistaken. Make a mistake. Absolutely. And as we usually say at the end of every episode of Disclosure Tonight, we'll just kind of cut this quick. I want to thank everybody for coming out. And uh, eyes open, no fear, be safe, everyone. But... We'll catch you on the flip side. Good night, everybody. Love you. Talk to you soon. I'll come back now. Here. Nice.